And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is David Moquin, who during his near-death experience learned that we can communicate with our loved ones on the other side while we are here. David, thank you for joining me and welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I look forward to this. David, if you don't mind, let's start on the day that you had your NDE and go from there. Okay. Uh, Actually, at the time I had my NDE, it was the very last day of school. In June, it was a Monday in June on 1988. And uh, I had been sick for a couple of days over the weekend. I had a high temperature and uh, I, in order to feel normal, I would sit in my swimming pool to stay cool. I didn't know that I was that sick. You know, I just had headaches and I just didn't feel good. And it was the last day of school, so I drove to school. Except that on the way, I kept blacking out. I get get very dizzy. So after an hour or so, I went to the principal's office and I said, Neil, I'm sick. I have to go home while I can still drive. So I started driving home. And when I got on the bridge that goes from Springfield to West Springfield, Massachusetts, it goes over the Connecticut River. It's called the North End Bridge. I was halfway over the bridge and I could not see. I shut off. My engine, I put the flashes on, and I literally passed out. Next thing you know, I hear banging and rapping, and the police arrived, and they got another cruiser in, and somebody drove my car, and they they brought me home. And uh, they made me promise to call a doctor, but they got me home. And again, I don't remember a whole lot of that because I kept blacking out. When I got home, I went in the swimming pool. I was feeling a little better, and... Uh, At five o'clock, I received a phone call from my eldest daughter's boyfriend. Said that they had a situation and he's taking her to the hospital. I was alarmed, so I got in my car and I drove to the hospital. The last thing I remember was seeing the parking lot and turning into the parking lot by the emergency room. The next thing I remember, and it may have been a day or two days later, I'm in ICU with all kinds of liquids and all kinds of things. And I didn't know what happened. And my NDE is going to be a series of basically, I didn't have anything like a lot of them were an accident and and they were operating on them and everything is kind of harsh and severe and really distinct. I thought it was drifting in and out of like the dream state, you know? Uh, I was just all of a sudden just be black, uh, maybe dream, uh, had no idea what was going on. I didn't care. And all of a sudden I, I was somewhere else and I was absolutely home. If I could say anything about the feeling, it's, it's, I'm, I'm home again, you know, and the love and everything. And it's like, you, you. You know everybody, and I'm talking about like billions of people or billions of souls or something. You're part of everything, and everything is part of you. And uh, I didn't get some of the senses other have, others have, but I did get the sense that I did see fields and things of that nature, uh, but they didn't look normal. They were a thousand percent more normal. It was the the colors and the shades and and I never could describe this to anyone. I never tried. Then I, it was a near death podcast. I don't know if yours or somebody else's a week ago uh, described it and said it was the light, the inside light of the atoms, or, or the light coming from within, not the light from the sun reflecting or from the lights in a room. And I said, "Wow, that's pretty. That's kind of what it felt like to me." That, that everything emanates its light from inside. And I mean, the shades and the types of colors, we don't know here. There's no point in describing it. Like a bat trying to describe how it how it sees without eyes or, or how eagles see and all of this. We have a very limited toolbox here as human beings as far as perception of reality and the realities out there. Uh, yeah, and it, so it's hard to get our minds around it and explain it to anybody. 
And so I was experiencing that and then kind of in a gentle way. Uh, and then I, I'd be coming back and forth, it seemed. And uh, I do remember uh, kind of looking around me and I was like just hanging in the dark. I could see stars or something out there. But it was just like I was just stuck up and stuck up in space. And uh, all of a sudden I saw thousands of these holograms. You know, didn't have screens or anything. They're just holograms. And they were scenes of of my life. And not just this life, other lives. Uh, and I, I never felt that there was a God judging me. I never felt I was supposed to judge myself. When I saw them, I it was just to, to understand the experience. It was about understanding, that we can understand it while we're here. But when we're there, we get another whole way of understanding it from the viewpoint of whatever it is, the person or whatever the item is. And the one I do remember was a little dog. My kids brought home this little dog one time. It was stray. It was lost. So I brought it to the pound because we couldn't have it. And, uh, and she said they were going to euthanize the dog. And she took the dog from me. I thought they were going to find a home for it. I could. I did not. Asked for the dog back. I got in the car. I kind of felt I should save that dog. I didn't. That was brought to me because I've felt guilty about that my entire life. It was a cute, cute little dog. Deserved a home. And I brought it there and it's going to get killed. And that was supposed to be. I was informed that was supposed to be. And the reason was because later in my life, I would be needed to have the right attitude towards animals in life. And that's why that experience took place, which had me understand that maybe the experiences we have, we think we're in control and we do that, but maybe we're not. Maybe we have, you know, a goal we're supposed to reach and they set things up for us to reach it. And they, they have us learn things for later on in our life that would be important. Uh, I really felt that. And uh, just explaining it to you and revisiting it, I can just feel and see the whole thing. Uh, so that was one of many, and there were hundreds and hundreds of them, but I don't think I was supposed to remember them. This is near death, say this or not, but I had a huge amount of experience on the other side, and I think it was over several days, and I think it was like in, in waves or something, but I have very little recollection of most of it. Uh, I've come away with, with more feelings than anything. And uh, let me see what else did I notice over there, that we, I know we don't die. Uh, we don't end at all. Uh, everybody they ever knew was a lot uh, that had passed, they were there too. And I also got that from other life experiences. While I was in that bed, I was going in and out and I, I had experienced three past lives. And I knew it at the time. Here I am, a vegetable in this bed, and and I'm having these, and I know they're past lives. There's, you know, I just knew that's what they were. And and I still have them to this day, every single detail of them. They weren't long. They were like little, little clips, you know. One was I had fallen into the ocean off the back of a clipper ship. And when I looked up, back of the clipper ship i'm looking way up and uh make, you know i think five or eight stories high and i'm probably only a few yards from the boat it's a stormy night the water's cold there's lightning going on and they don't know i fell off the ship and uh and i had just bobbed back up to the surface from falling in and then a wave took me down when i came back up again um the ship is further away and uh, and I'm tired. And the next wave comes over. I go down, I come up, and the ship is even further away, like a quarter of a mile away. And I knew uh, it's over, game time. And I just, I didn't even go down and drown in, in what they brought me. I just went black. It was just the end of that snip. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But that to a fellow. I had another one where I was... Uh, with other boys my age, it was either in India or Africa or someplace, and there was a lot of, like, uh, it wasn't a river. There was just, like, 
like mud and water and there was fish in there. And we were trying to catch them with our feet. I was a little boy, probably 10 years old. And we were catching them and giggling and laughing and trying to grab them with our feet. And uh, it was intensely joyful. And I felt really, really connected to earth. And that ended, it just stopped, you know? And uh, it felt was strange. And then I had another one, I don't know if it was in Turkey or Syria or, or uh, somewhere in that area. Uh, but there were many, many of these animals uh, there. I don't know if they were llamas or, or sheep or what they were. And I was in charge of them. And I had this box that had a lot of little drawers in it. And inside were these little wooden tabs. And there's markings on them. And I just knew that my job was an accountant that was supposed to keep track of those animals. And again, I was there instantly. And then I was off. Black. Like I said, like little snippets but i knew there were peaks in my past lives for what reason i've yet to find out you know there was a reason for that or not then i had a particularly interesting thing happen uh well it was three other things i had out of body experiences um i had one where i was could see my folks in Florida, 1,500 miles away, celebrating their anniversary and eating lobster. And I literally, literally was there for an hour. I watched the whole thing. And yet my body is up here in Massachusetts. And I watched it. And uh, I saw another scene with my, that time, uh, my wife wasn't my wife, but we had our five kids together. I had raised three kids myself, and we had merged together. And she wasn't related to me, so I guess she couldn't visit me or something. And um, the kids were all throwing food and making, you know, just being mean and nasty. And she's crying because she doesn't, she doesn't at this point think I'm going to live. And she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know who to contact, what my folks in Florida, they don't know anything about her. She has no information. And I experienced that. And uh, I would say probably about 15, 20 minutes. Then here's the, here's the one that really got me. This is what changed everything. I saw my doctor, and I still can't quite get it right, whether it was one or two clergymen, a priest and a minister, or one or the other. And I felt they were in my room. But I couldn't open my eyes. I'm laying there. But I'm seeing them because I'm above the headboard of the bed. I'm just, I'm seeing from about five feet above the headboard. I'm watching them there. And I'm hearing them. And, uh, and my eyes are closed. And I can remember Dr. Enko saying to the clergy, would you check in on Mr. Moquin this evening and give him the last rites? I don't think he's going to be with us when I make my rounds at 6.30 tomorrow morning. Now, I want to just back up a little bit. Once before then, shortly probably after I was in there, I had the same experience of being above my bed and watching Jeannie at that time. She got there at first, I guess the first time I was there, and there were some friends there, and they were talking to me. I don't recall whether I had my eyes open or spoke to them, but I just had the scene of watching them looking at me and talking to me. And uh, and, I, and I was there for a while. And uh, then again, I, I felt like I was just seeing and going to sleep, seeing and going to sleep. But this one with the, the doctor really bothered me. And I said, I guess I'm going to die. And I, uh, and, uh, and it's like when the minute I realized I was dying, then things started to happen very quickly. I did not want to, if, if I'm going to leave the place I have been, I don't want to come back. I really don't want to, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm content. You know, I don't need to go back to all that stuff. Then I don't know, Jeff, whether it was me deciding and knowing that my three girls would be orphans 
And Jeannie would have an awful mess with her two babies and mine and all of that, that I had to come back or they decided I had to come back and sent me back. I'm not sure which it is. But again, the doctor scared me, then that took place, and then I woke up. I literally woke up, really woke up, and I saw a nurse standing the doorway to the room. And I said, nurse, can you get me some water? And I'll never forget this. She turned around and looked at me, and her eyes got big, and she just left the room. She just left. You know, I thought that was kind of impolite. <laughs> you know, at least say something. What did I ever do to you, you know? I didn't realize I had been, they did basically sign me off. Brain dead. I had a temperature of 107 for I don't know how many days. And uh, so next thing I know, again, I shut my eyes and I hear some busting. I open my eyes. And again, I'm really here now. All that time, I don't think I ever was really, really there. Uh, I think it was when the doctor said that, that reality came. And um, the doctors and nurses came in and they measured me, tested me, asked me questions, putting stuff, grabbing everything. Um, and, and they're all, wow, he's alive, he's alive. No kidding. Would you please give me the water? <laughs> all this, I just want water. You know, you don't have to massage me and throw me all over the place and change everything on me. Just give me some water. Now, here's, here's the crazy thing. I didn't like pineapple. Never liked it. My mother made me eat pineapple. It was doles in a can. I just thought it was nasty stuff as a child. There was a fruit basket somebody left there near my bed. And there was a big pineapple in the middle of it. And I don't like pineapple. I just soon not allow it in the state, you know. But when I saw that pineapple... And a nurse told me later that I really pointed to it and screamed, I want that goddamn pineapple. And I, so uh, they took everything out and they cut all the fruit up, including the pineapple. And uh, I had some water. Give me a glass of water to the pitcher right there. They're still measuring me, testing me. I guess my temperature at that time was between 105 and 106. I had come down a little bit. And... Um, and obviously, I wasn't brain dead, although people today think I am. But anyway, uh, I started eating. I ate all the pineapple first. Oh, man, it tasted so good. And uh, and I drank a lot of water. I think I drank at least one pitcher, if not more. And back and forth, you know, I had to carry all these bottle things. I had to go to the, you know, the bathroom and because uh, I refused to use the other thing. And uh, so I, that was about nine o'clock at night. It's six, six o'clock in the morning. My temperature is down to 101. I drank and I peed and I ate all night long. It's 101. I was released from the hospital a day or so later. Then I had to go visit my doctor for exam a couple of weeks later. When I visited him, I thanked him. I said, doctor, you have no idea how grateful I am to you for saving my life. He said, what are you talking about? So then I reiterated the conversations I heard with him. And back then I knew it was whether 201, but now for some reason, 36 years later, I'm not so sure. Um, I reiterated it, exactly what he said. And it scared me. And he said to me, I'll never forget this. He's from uh, the Philippines. He said, Mr. Mokon, everything you have just said is absolutely accurate, except for one small detail. That conversation took place in my office a mile and a half from the hospital. Yeah. And uh, that was wormy. But to say everything, nothing made sense. Like I said, uh, there was no traumatic thing that jammed me to the other side. I just gently went in out of there, and it was almost like having a sequence of bad dreams, you know, a goofy dreams or imagination. And uh, I mentioned a couple of these things, and I was just told, well, when your brain gets that hot, you imagine things. But how do I imagine that sequence? 
So I dismissed it. Put it out of my mind. You have to understand that for the next 17 years, I put this to bed. Uh, however, this is important. I wasn't David Moquin anymore. I ceased to exist as David Moquin. I now was more of a committee. I now was more of a team. For some reason, I was I talked to myself, knowing that I'm being listened to. I could feel that I am more than just me talking to myself and listening. I literally just felt like a crowd. But it was a good feel. It was a natural. It was just absolutely natural. I still am talking to you. I've got all this working with me, and, and we're doing this together with you. Now, that sounds creepy, but this is exactly uh, we have been conducting myself since. And the other thing is love. I can, when I came out of the hospital, I love everybody. And and even if they're a person that's evil or bad or something, I find the love in them. I see it. They show it to me. In a way, my near death has been continual. Uh, uh, this Some of what I had there and doing has not left. I've pushed it aside. I've ignored it. But, yeah, I, I'm living pieces of it or part of it or, or shadow of it. Whatever it is, I don't know. But it's it's there. And I don't know if other people have had these MDs say that too. Uh, but you feel like you're one with everything. And you, yeah, you, you feel like, um, yeah, you, you, you make, you're not making decisions alone anymore. And, and you'll get, I get pushed around a lot. It's slow down, stop. They will interrupt me when something's not right. So I'll listen to them. Whatever this is, I, I'm very, very reluctant to put labels, pack things up in ribbons and boxes. I just as soon just be happy with not understanding. I don't understand any of it, nor do I need to here in this lifetime. And I think a lot of people go to a lot of, uh, in their lifetime, they, they waste a lot of their lifetime trying to understand something we're not supposed to understand. Instead of listening to it and accepting it and reacting to it and, and allowing it to be part of who we are. So uh, I went on with my life. and uh, But around two, fall of 2005, all of a sudden, I, they started an awakening with me or something. I could say I assimilated all that as being just me, and I didn't pay much attention to it. I certainly didn't think of anything supernatural or what we call spiritual here. Uh, and I didn't believe in anything spiritual. And if you told me that you could talk to somebody on the other side, I would say, no way. I'm away from you. Well, none of this. Uh, spiritualist churches, all these things, uh, it just absolutely was the opposite. I'm a scientist. I'm an engineer. I'm Newtonian. Although I was studying quantum at the time, which walks across a lot of borders. But uh, all of a sudden, it was beginning to change. I'd wake my wife up in the morning and I'd say to a genie, write this stuff down. And I would tell her something in great detail, and it would occur in about 48 hours. I mean, right to the detail. I would see somebody on television. I remember this specifically. There was a, a a news broadcaster on TV, and they said to my wife, her son has got cancer of the kidneys, and he's dying. My wife said, how do you know that? I just, I just know things all of a sudden. I just know things. And uh, she laughed me off. About a week or a week and a half later, uh, I go home from work. She said, Dave, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? They just announced a broadcaster wasn't going to be on tonight because her son just passed with that kidney cancer. They call it something else. That's phenol or something cancer. And uh, she looked at me, I looked at her. And she says, you know, you're not right. <laughs> she says, you know, this is getting really spooky. You know, uh, I woke up one morning at 4 o'clock and I ran into my music room. And started playing old Cape Cod, 
And my wife came and she said, what are you doing? And I'm crying. The woman I dated before my wife, uh, I had taken her to the Cape for a week. And the poor girl never really had a chance to, to go on vacations. And she really appreciated it and all that. And uh, but we were just really good friends. And um, she went one way, I went the other, but we stayed friends. And uh, I used to play at John Brown's. And she came with her other boyfriend two or three times. And every time she came there, she'd come up to the bandstand. And she said, would you play Old Cape Cod for me? And I did. Well, that morning, I was driven to play Old Cape Cod, and I'm crying. And, uh, and it's because I had a dream. I dreamt they saw her, and she had an orchid, a pinkish orchid on, uh, a choker, a pearl choker and a, 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 a kind of a gownish thing. And she was saying, please play Old Cape Cod for me. So I came in and did it. And I described that to my wife. And uh, I was going to dismiss it. And Jeannie said to me, she says, you know, David, all your dreams come true. This is kind of scary. So that was a Sunday morning at 4 o'clock that happened. Tuesday afternoon, I get home from work, and she's got the paper, and she says, Debbie died. And I'm going to have the wake on Thursday. I went to the wake on Thursday. She's laying there in the coffin with that gown, the orchid, and the choker. And so I asked her daughter, I said, when did your mother pass? She said, four o'clock Sunday morning. So that happened. It just happened. I still am in the process of dismissing everything. My wife now isn't dismissing everything. That uh, was another instance where I had this dream. I woke up and I said, I dreamt that I didn't have the beard and that I was playing at the anchor room in Holyoke. Just me, but people were playing then. I was playing sax before. And, uh, and I was playing Bad, Bad Leroy Brown and a woman behind me said, the meanest bastard in town, and a glass broke at the uh, on the bar. Somebody dropped the glass and it broke. And uh, they had two bands. There was no way I would ever play there. I wasn't really playing much anymore anyway. And uh, people knew I could. I'd do weddings once in a while. But not much. So that was a Friday morning. I told her about that. She went off. It was a holiday on October 1st, teachers. And I was trimming something, and I made a mistake, and I made a big mess in my face. And so I took my beard off. I forgot about the dream. Took the beard off. That night, she wanted to go out to dinner somewhere. And we started going down this drive where there's all kinds of uh, restaurants and nothing. She didn't like any of the restaurants. Oh, let's not go here. We get to the end of it. We're almost in Holyoke. And she said, let's go to the anchor room. And I'm going, uh-oh. Oh, no, 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 this isn't going to be. So we get to the anchor room and we're being served. And there's a, the band that's on Saturday night was playing Friday night. So I asked the waitress, so what's going on with that? And she says, well, such and such can't play tonight. So he's playing and he can't play tomorrow night. Do you know of any musicians? We don't have anybody for tomorrow night. And I looked over at my wife and she's going, Oh, no, oh, no, 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 Took out my card and gave it to her. Sure enough, Saturday night, I played there. And it was really a rainy, bad, bad night, and blowing like crazy. I got there an hour early to set up, and they asked me if I could start early to keep the bar crowd there from leaving because they're afraid they may not have a big dinner crowd, you know. Sure, I'll start early. Now, in my dream, it was exactly 10 o'clock when that happened with Leroy Brown, all right? So the evening's going fine, and I'm playing requests and doing all kinds of things. And somebody did ask for Leroy Brown, so I'm playing Leroy Brown. And then, not paying attention, all of a sudden, a hair went back of my neck when I heard a woman say, the meanest bastard in town. And then, just as I was aware of that, the glass broke on the bar. I finished off the song. I'm trembling now. I go into the men's room. I look in the mirror. I'm just sweating. I say, oh, boy. <laughs> What is going on here? And I finished off the evening and went home. I told my wife about it. Now, why is that important? 
because come the next spring, and I had a lot of things, all went along, I had dreams come true. I'd think it's just, it was just, it was just wacky. And I would know stuff I shouldn't know. So it's uh, July or something, and she sees this ad by Holyoke Community College for something about psychic and this kind of thing. So she signs up for me for a one night thing. As it turns out, it was uh, Steve Herman. He's an internationally known medium, and he was doing a gig there. And so uh, something made me get a recorder because I thought it was going to be a lecture that I might want to, you know, record so I could pay attention to it and then refer to it afterwards. So I get there, and I recognize two of the doctors there because I had developed some programs with the colleges and the companies, and I was teaching nights in some colleges too. And so I knew them. And, oh, Dave, you're here, da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, what's going on with all this anyway? And then she said, well, Steve Herman, he's going to bring our loved ones that have passed. And I'm saying, oh, boy, I'm out of here. Are you kidding me? I am not going to do this. I felt like I was conned in something, you know. And then he waltzes up to me and he says, Mr. Moquin. Now, he knew my name because I was the only male there. <laughs> All female, so not a real big guessing game on his part. He says, they are telling me that they've worked really hard to get you in this situation tonight. They've been working a long time. Would you please stay here? Because I know you want to leave. He was picking me up pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I agreed to. Then he started singing children's song. Everybody's singing this old man and all that. And I'm saying, oh, boy, am I impressed. You know, oh, yeah, this is what I came here for. And then he walks up to me again because I'm still looking at the door. <laughs> and he says, uh, would you please stay? I'm, I have a message for you. So when he did come to me, I asked him for the recorder. He said, yeah. And Jeff, I have to tell you something. It was the most astounding 15 seconds of my life. The reading went on for about three minutes, but in 15 seconds, this Newtonian guy went from there to knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt, my father had not ended. And it's the only message I ever recorded. And I transcribed it when I got home and I can share it with anybody and everybody. It is amazing. And he depicted exactly what our behavior with each other was like. And he also said that his role model was John Wayne. That's how men should behave. But he is so proud of me, and he thinks that I am doing the right role model with my students at the college. He died before I ever taught at the college. So I know he's with me. And all the things are said, no human being knows. Has any idea? And that was it. I knew it was possible. And I thought Steve Herman was the only person in the universe that could do something like that. I mean, I just never heard of it before. You know, and the evidence was, it was just real. And that's quite a flip. All right, from absolutely certain it doesn't exist to absolutely certain it does. And, uh, I got home that night. Oh, he then said to me, I, I, I stayed, obviously. And I spoke to him afterwards. And he said to me, he has mediums from all over the world coming to a thing in October. And he would like me to go there. Because he said, they're telling me you're going to be a master teacher of what I do, which I didn't believe for a second. It seems to be, uh, it probably is true now. But um, I didn't that time think it was. And... Uh, So in October, I attended it, and with me went the uh, assistant dean to the college, engineering, because I found out he was into this, particularly the healing parts. So he got a hold of Steve, and, and so we went together. This is very interesting. I heard everybody talking there, and they were doing supposed readings, and I just, it was, I just felt it was phony. I felt it was wrong. There was nothing happening. I shouldn't be there. Saturday morning, they do what they call psychometry. I have a basket. Everybody puts something in it. And you draw somebody else's out, and then you hold on to it, 
and supposedly you can pick up some information. I didn't believe it for a second. I was the last person called on to reveal what I had. And I said, I have this stupid earring and I don't have anything. I just wanted to get out, go hear the ball game in the car. You know? And I was pretty much disgusted with everything. And, uh, and Steve said he never did this before or afterwards, but he said, David, would you please stand up? He says, I would like you to go to the people here and just make up a lie. Just make up a story. That's all you have to do. He told me later he it just that he just did that. He didn't even plan on doing that. It was like he was observing himself doing that. Something else was going on here, right? The first person I went to, believe it or not, was an engineer. His name is Bob Leo. I called him last night. I, I told him about our interview today and that maybe. Uh, you might be interested in having him on. Uh, he's an engineer like me. Uh, he had near-death experience. That's amazing. You're going to hear about that in a minute because that's when I first found out that I had one. Uh, and he's a great medium, too. So anyway, I go to him first, and I said, I have a gentleman here. I feels like it's your father, and he's they're playing Moonlight Sonata. He's dancing with his wife. It's the 50th anniversary, and he's saying he died of a stroke two weeks later. Then I went to the next person, next person. I just said these, thinking they were lies. And then it was time to go to lunch, and Steve's talking to me. Everybody went downstairs. By the time I got downstairs, everybody's got their food. It was molds. It was a vegetarian kind of thing. And it was like porridge. Um, nobody was seated. So I sat at a table, and they all gathered around. They all started telling me about the people I brought to them. And a lot of them were by name. And I, I said, it's that simple? It's that easy? I just, I was wondering what kind of a lie to make up, and then just thoughts and things came to me, and then it happened. I said, wow, this, this, this trip doesn't end, does it? It just keeps getting crazier and crazier. Yeah. And uh, and they were blown away from it, by it. And um, and then I, I just didn't do anything with it for six or eight months. And you said you heard about Tina Angela. Well, this friend of mine that went with me, Skip Tenza, assistant to the dean, he called me up and said there's a circle. that He wants to go to what I go with him. I did. I walked in, it was Tina's circle. I'd never been to a circle before. And she introduced herself to me. And when she went to do the first reading, she turned to me and she says, my guides are telling me to have you bring that woman the reading she needs. What? So I turned to her and I brought it. I can remember, I says, you're supposed to say something to your brother-in-law. Your, your mother and your sister want you to say something to him and you're afraid to do it. And she says, that's right. Uh, this saying, ask him to help you do it. Call him up and say, gee, I have to tell you something, and I don't know how to do it. Can you help me? No, fine. Then as it ended up, uh, she and I both brought readings to everybody that night. Same thing, and the loved ones come in by name and everything. And that was the start of it. And uh, after many months, uh, I was advised to go to a spiritualist church. I did, and uh, I started attending there because you go downstairs, I could bring people readings at, you know, during coffee. We just sat there and the loved ones would come in. It was, you know, pretty natural. But here's, here's a crazy thing that happened. In November, I was sitting in the back pew, which is what I would do. I'd sit in the back pew, and as mediums would bring messages, I'd pick up the messages coming to them. Oftentimes, they were missing the messages, weren't getting them. And then I would bring them to the people downstairs. Well, the minister didn't like that. He heard about it, and he was mad. And so he was, he was going to do something. Now, I'm sitting in the back there, and the medium comes to me. Meanwhile, my mother and grandmother are getting my attention. And... And I had my eyes shut. The medium said, sir, back there, are you sleeping? I said, no. I'm talking to my mother and grandmother. She says, well, I have them here. And uh, I said, what, what do they got to say? She says, they want you to know you're 
this is the beginning of your journey and they'll be with you for the entire journey. Very interesting. And uh, right afterwards, the minister, after the service, he came up to me and he's scolding me. This is a spiritualist church. We don't bring messages to people in the spiritualist church. You know what I'm saying? Oh, this is a swimming pool, but we don't swim. You know, it didn't make sense to me. So anyway, he says, I want you to take the Morris Pratt course. And you'll find out when you get up there, bring a message, you don't know what you're doing. You know? Well, make things short. I did the Morris Pratt course. Uh, I would go up there and I'd bring, you have me bring three messages before the next medium. And they have what they call affidavits. And people can write an affidavit and say, yes, this in fact was a valid message for these reasons. Well, every week I went up there, I got three, three validations. I did that for several weeks and told me not, no, not to bother with the validations anymore. And that's how that went. Uh, so I spent quite a time with that church. I left that church, went with another one. I became an ordained minister. I finished the Morris Pratt thing. And I want to say this. This is very important for everybody to know. You do not need to be an ordained minister. You do not need to attend the church. You do not need to take a Morris Pratt course or even read a book. Everything you need to know about this, you already have. It's built in at birth, everything. What we're lacking is the idea that you can listen to it. The religions say so they will do the listening and tell us what's going on. When when you feel like saying or something occurs to you, trust it. When you put out an intent, you're trying to fix something or repair something. You put out an intent. Oh man, I can't figure this out. Darn it. I really need to figure this out. So I how with it. You get up, you start walking away. Then you go, oh, wait a minute, I got an idea. You go back and that's it. You can't remember a name. Jeff, I can't remember your first name right now, okay? Uh, if you can't remember a name, you, you, oh, man, I can't remember. The minute you stop trying, have you ever noticed that? The minute you let go, the name pops in you. Why is that? See if this makes sense. We have been trained since birth that our brain creates our thoughts. We are convinced that if you go and you listen to something and put it in there, you control it, you put it in. Then you create and you send out. It's the furthest from the truth. Your brain, your mind, which might be different than your brain, is a two-way trans transceiver, what they call it in the military. You can transmit and you can receive, but you can't do both at the same time. But we don't know that we can receive. We think we're transmitting all the time. So we have built, since we were babies, we've built this filtering system that filters out anything we didn't create or didn't decide we were going to put into our brain. So we're not listening to anything. We're not listening to the universe. How do spiders know how to build a web? How do monarch butterflies go all the way up three generations of Canada and fly all the way back? Because they're listening. Because... The universe, whatever we are, every atom of the universe has all the intelligence of the universe in it. That's the only thing they can subscribe to if you understand anything about biochemistry and what's going on. That innate atoms become life as we perceive them. When Einstein said that an atom is 99.9999% intelligence and it's not in the particles, it's in the field. You look at the solar system. You take all of the sun and all of the planets, and you take the volume of all of them, compare it to the volume of the solar system, it's a grain of sand on the beach. Same with an atom. It's all intelligence. Well, if that's the case, and quantum science looks at this, by the way, that means that everything is, every single atom is 99% intelligence, not material. You're not talking to a material person here. That might mean I'm intelligent, though. That'd be a good thing. <laughs> so that's quite an awakening. And uh, that's how some of this works. I forgot where I, I got sidetracked. I forgot what I was talking about. Well, that's okay. Let me ask you a few questions here. Sure. Absolutely. 
If you put on your engineer's hat and think about this, do you feel that there is no free will? For example, like when you had the dog put down and then later that was something that was supposed to be. If you think about that, does that mean that there's no free will and everything's planned out? This question you're asking me, I have continually think of all the time. I have to say both. I, I'd have to say both. We're given free will, but somehow... Now, I am where I am because I, from birth, I listened. I, I, I would follow impulses, and I did things that were contrary to what my plans were. So I don't know. I don't have an answer for you on that. Um, I, could, I could lean one way and have tons of, not proof, but substance. But then I'd go the other way and have just as much. So I'm content to not know. Uh, uh, the thing that I, I worked the hardest at, I'm 79 years old. I'm in my 80th year. The re reason why I'm on your podcast tonight is the things that I've experienced. And it seems so I'm experiencing these, and I am a teacher of this connection. It wasn't my desire. And, and I, I could go on and on about all the things, whatever this is, did to get me where I am. Uh People need to understand and know that they don't end. They need to know that their loved ones are living with them. If they're sad, all these energies around them and people that are the energies of people I knew are experiencing it with them. And that's a hard reality, but I think it's very healing for people when they know They've lost somebody and that person is with them and wants them to be happy, not be sad about it. And then they bring them evidence. Usually when they come through me, I get calls out to people die. I get I get calls from all over. Uh, I spend 20, 30, sometimes 40 hours a week on the phone helping people with things. And uh, I've been accused of neglecting getting this out and sharing it with people. Because when I pass, you know, I, I, I want to have a legacy out there so that People can know that this is so. They are not alone. They have the ability to do what I do. I want to try this with you for a second. All right. Look, are we okay time-wise? Yeah. Two things I'm going to suggest. One is, if you have a word find book, a book with word finds, you can get connected to your guidance system very quickly. And I mean, really unbelievable. With a, with a word find, because we've tried all kinds of things. With a word find, if you do it a different way, if you look at, if you just look up in the air and say to the universe, look, hey guys, uh, I want you to pick out a word for me and I want you to find it for me. Now, wouldn't you say that's pretty impossible? Yeah. Wow. So you down, then I have people glance down at the pile of words and then lift the head right up. And a word will stick in your mind. Don't forget, you put out an intent for them to find the word for it. Glance down, look up, the word will stick in your mind. Then you go over to the letters and you kind of stare at the center of them, but don't focus. Just sort of let your eyes lay there. And then you know, intent is saying, no, find me that word. And just, and just, this takes a little time. Just relax and relax enough so that your eyes can pull themselves. So all of a sudden you feel your eyes drawing, moving. And depending upon, you know, a lot of things, you, it might take you a little while to relax enough and get sensitive enough to do that. Once that starts happening, it moves around. Okay, you just follow. It'll draw, it'll draw you down this way, maybe, maybe over, maybe circular, and all of a sudden it stops, it doesn't move anymore. The word pops right up. Funny. Now, I don't blame you if you say that's impossible. Can't happen. We've been doing this a long time, and it takes people sometimes a few tries. 
Let me um, stop you there. So you're saying you get a book of words or a list of words? No, this is a word find book. It puts a letters, word? the oh. word find book, you circle, you, you got the words over there and you circle the letters that makes the words. Like you mean when you see a whole bunch of letters and then you circle it, like either it's going sideways yeah, or up or absolutely. down or diagonal. Uh, okay. With the dollar store, you can get piles. Right. Of okay. So you, what you do is you just look up and say, no, you look, you, you first thing you say is your intent is, because you're going to test this because you don't believe in it, right? Okay. So you're going to say, okay, this is so. I want you to pick a word out of the words available mm -hmm. and then find the word over in the letters. So then you glance down at the letter, uh, at the words. Just glance down quickly, enough so to pick up the words, but don't focus on one, and then look up. And whatever word seems to pop in your mind, that's the word you're going to find over here in the letters. Mm -hmm. Over to all the letters, you kind of let your eyes rest in the middle of them all, and you'll wait for your eyes to stop moving. They'll pull and pull and pull, and then they'll stop. Now, mind you, these sensations are very delicate, and it'll take a little while to calm down to actually do it. So as I say, do it in private, have patience, don't give up right away, all right? Because I'm going to say something. When this happens, boom, you get it. The word's there. Now you feel, what did, how did that feel to your mind? And what was going on inside when that happened? So we can have it happen again. And you practice this. I've had people do the entire puzzle that way. People mm -hmm. that didn't believe in it when wow. it started. I've done it. I practice with it, but I keep cheating once. I, I, I find myself doing it the old fashioned way too. I said, okay, hold on. I have a trust factor. I'm an engineer. I don't really tend to want to believe this stuff. You know, maybe, maybe that's why I'm chosen to do it because of my background. I don't know. And uh, maybe because they had me learn to teach intangible things well take electronics and make a hands-on understanding of something that's hard to make this hands-on, this connection hands-on and have people learn by doing it, not talking about it, talk to you. And I don't expect you to understand or believe this unless you try it and have it happen for you. It does seeing the future and potentially seeing good things or bad things in the future bother you to the point where you don't want to look at the future because you're going to find out so-and-so maybe is going to die or something bad is going to happen. I get some of that, but here's what they tell me or what I seem to, you see, I just know and understand things. So I guess whatever this is, again, I don't try to understand everything, but I trust it, but I don't understand. I can still trust. This is like a one act play being here. This whole thing is concerted. And when you meet somebody that you feel you've known your entire life, I mean, really feel that way. You've done that, right? Bumped into somebody, it's like you've always known them, right? I think so. That's because you've probably had other lifetimes where you, they were like a one-act play. They were also playing roles. And, uh, and sometimes we play parts where maybe we're supposed to be evil or, or what you would consider evil. My sense is there is no... Uh, you have to have dark to have light. You have to have something we consider as humans bad. Actually, death isn't bad because it's all an ex it's all an experience, and so we need what we consider bad acting people for us to have the experience of no good or experience the bad. Maybe that's part of understanding too. I don't know, but I, it's temporary, and uh, it could be a million galaxies out there, or. or Right here, there could be a lot of realities. I don't know. But they have me sense that. Now, I do do see things in the future. Once in a while, I'll see what's going to happen coming towards somebody. But I don't tell them. They don't want me to tell them because then they will try to make it happen and screw it all up. And the only reason they have me know is so maybe... If they're all upset and everything else, I can bring a calmness to them so I can do something constructively. Now, after your NDE, you mentioned that you have this group of people 
-hmm. or group of something that you communicate with. Like even now you're using the word they, they tell me to do this. Yeah. Who are they and how are they communicating with you? Very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, it's like, and we're also part of it. Uh, it, I think includes intelligence of the universe, intelligence of creation. I think it includes, uh, any intelligences out there that can help us with whatever we're working on. If I'm playing music, I can remember one time, uh, I had to sit in, they needed a clarinet sax player in the band. And so my boss sent me over to play in that band that night. And, um, they started playing a tune I didn't know. And it was a jazz piece. And, and right off the bat, they threw me the solo. And I can remember, I don't even know what key we're in. Well, the chord progression, nothing. And I said, what am I? I wonder what I, and next thing I know, I'm blowing it. And it's happening. I'm feeling it, sensing the whole night. It was over. What the heck happened? What was that all about? It was just amazing. Have you ever had that? You're a musician, right? Yes. I'm not sure but, if I've ever had that happen. Well, yeah. You know, I do explain some of the things that happened to me through my life. And and uh, some, I guess I've had some things that don't happen too common. I don't know. I've never considered myself. I've never actually considered myself actually as good as anybody else. I've always had an inferiority complex for some reason. Uh, but I want to get to one more thing that is very, very important. I've been a lot of talk today, so here's a little walk here. And people can do it as they're watching this if they want. You take a pad of paper and a pencil or a pen and write a note to a loved one on the other side. Simply write them a note. Hey, Mom, I've been thinking you a lot. How are you doing? There? I wonder about this. Any kind of a note you want. Put the pen or pencil down. Have a cup of coffee, drink it. Take a couple minute break or something. And and wonder, gee, I wonder what my mom thinks about what I wrote. I wonder what she says. And you pick up the pen and pencil, just start to write. But write what, so if, if, if thoughts or things come into your mind, you, you, you won't have a problem because it'll happen. You'll be surprised. You'll be absolutely blown away. I'm not going to say it'll happen the first time because you probably have a lot of guards up. You're probably going to fight it. But if you can trust me, same with the word fine, what harm does it do? Put a little time in until you can get uh, uh, past the this is impossible thing, okay? We have had brand new people pop on our Zoom meeting on Tuesday nights. And, of course, they read the top thing, and all of us, it's a channel, so all of us bring it. Just, and oftentimes, it's what they wrote afterwards. Everybody is the same thing something going on here and i invite you or anybody to uh, join us on tuesday night but these are two things i want to leave with you and again i would think most of you out there would think that oh that's ridiculous but try it i think you're going to be very surprised you can talk to your loved ones all the time if people want to join your zoom meetings how yes. do they do that can i give you the number the, the, the uh you can say it and everybody can write it down or is there a okay. link to a website or something? A link to Zoom, yeah. And there's no password to this one. The link is, everybody gets your pencil handy, or you're, you're watching this, so you've got, or you can record it, the whole thing. The link is 634-947-7988. And we've had new people come in. I did a podcast a week ago. Uh, with Peggy Robinson, and we had some people join and have joined us since then. I've gotten a lot of phone calls too. Uh, we also have a Facebook page. It's called Tuesdays with Dave. And you'll be, you have to ask to be joined on it, and she will put you on within a day or so. You'll be on it. We want to keep it private to people of this interest and are already aware of us. We don't want, you know, that way you can talk about a Tuesday night, what happened, and we don't have any problems with that. So what time on Tuesday nights do you do this? We are on from 7 o'clock until 9 Eastern Standard Time. I request that people come on at least five minutes early so I can begin at 7. And this and is every Tuesday night? Yes. 
every Tuesday night. And that's the Zoom. And uh, is there anything else I'm missing? Uh, you also, uh, you can text message me. Should I put a phone number up here? If you want to give your phone number out to the world. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to do. Uh, I can be reached. You can email me. All right. Uh, that's safer. And it's all small letters, David G. Moquin at gmail.com. You will email me and I will put you on my email list. And you'll receive my weekly letter, Bridges letter. And we have a topic we discuss every week. And, and the discussions of things so internal, things that you always want to talk about, you never find anybody to talk about it. We've been working on on happiness and um, and content and things of that nature lately uh, that really goes places. Uh, so you'll get that, and you'll also get an inspiration letter that I put out every week for the for the churches. I have churches that they'll have me come on once in a while bring messages. Uh, I have a minister of one church that's my co-host, and he's a phenomenal medium. He and I both and most of our people would bring people in by name, you know, because that's what we want. Here's the intent I put out, and anybody can do this. I say to the universe, around Jeff, for instance. In fact, you can call me privately if you want to see who comes for you. Uh, well, you've got a lot of people, by the way, lined all the way back. Hmm. Um, wow. Yeah, <laughs> you've got a gang around you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, my intent is this. Whoever is around Jeff and loves him, let him know who you are, and I like names, and bring him something he needs right now. Now, here's what happens when I do this. I have given up all responsibility. So if something comes to my mind and make me want to say Sarah for some reason, uh, I, I just I don't look at it. I don't measure it. I don't judge it. I don't add anything or subtract anything because it will mean nothing to me. I want to give you an example on this. Uh, it will mean nothing to me because it's your frame of reference, not mine. So anything coming to my mind for you is a lie. And that's what gets in the way of a lot of people being able to do this. Understand, all animals do this. This is natural. We're born with this. We are supposed to do this. We're supposed to be connected and get guidance. Why do you think we're given a guidance system? That humanity has decided that we know everything. We're smarter than animals. We don't have to listen to Mother Nature. We don't have to listen to anything spiritual. In fact, it's a bad word. So that is the intent I put out there. So that, and when it comes to me, and it takes a little practice because it's hard letting go, it's hard to stop filtering. But that's what it is, and that's what my workshop does. Virtually, every person that comes on will be doing this. We do one hour of, of various things, and then the second hour, everybody writes a note to somebody on the other side or something or a question. And they try to get an answer, and then we all bring the answers in. And we do it. We practice. We don't talk about it. We do it. And and it's fascinating, and it's amazing. And uh, I just want the world, I want everybody to know that this is a born, you were born with this ability, this guidance system, and and it's it's natural. Is it? Do you think that we're also born to have conversations with a committee or a group of people like you do? Yes, and the proof of that is you have a crowd around you. Everybody that I ever come in contact with, even on the phone, uh, I sense a, a whole bunch of uh, energies. Uh, yeah. And this is one of those things, when you start experiencing it and start doing it, then it becomes. Then you start, oh, so that feeling is this. And, and when you get a feeling of a certain entity, then sometimes it'll come to you and you'll recognize that they have a different frequency. I want to just bring an example of a, one reading for you. And mm -hmm. with a promise this woman I would do that. Uh, she lost her, her son died, and somebody told her to come on. And she came on, and, uh, and some people brought her some readings of people. And uh, then I said, may I come to you? Because I've got a young man here. Uh, he said, 
I, I believe this is your son. He calls himself Zeke, and he was uh, he died 23 years of, of age in a motorcycle accident recently. And of course, our eyes are getting like this, you know. And uh, well, that's fine, Danny. And she had a son and daughter with her too. And first thing he came to was was a son. He said, "Thank you for taking my baseball glove. I'll be playing ball with you, please." You know, uh, no, I'm with you when you're playing with that. And he went to the daughter and he says, you'll always think of me when you eat gummy bears. He used to bring the gummy bears. And then his mother said, oh, has he got anything to say to me? And this is what came out of my mouth. Oh, ma, there's always room for spaghetti and meatballs. Now, nobody would say that because it would make any sense, right? She starts crying. All three of them started crying. The, the three days before he died, she, he was invited to supper. He shows up and she said to him, have you had dinner yet? He said, yeah, I had something. And she says, oh, Don, she says, I made spaghetti and meatballs for you. And he said, oh, Ma, there's always room for spaghetti and meatballs. He died three days later. Okay, does that say it all? And she gave me permission. I, I, I don't, I, I saved some of these because they're, they're teaching points. Probably the very last one I want to share that's awful important, particularly for you, is that one time I had this woman in my living room where I was doing this. We used to have 30 people a night. And, and her, a, a woman came in and said, I have a rose here. She says she's your mother. She's been gone for 25 years. And then she brought her daughter a whole bunch of stuff. I don't remember any of it. When it was over, I started to tremble and shaking like every atom of the popping in my body. I said, Rose, what are you doing to me? She says, David, I'm thanking you. She says, do you know what it's like being with your daughter for 25 years and th she thinks you have ended. She don't exist. And she cries out for you because she wants to celebrate her high school graduation, her college graduation, wants to celebrate her career, her marriage, her children, her, and, and, and talk about the divorce. All this time I've been with through all of it, she never knew I existed. Now she does. So when I do this, Jeff, I do it for the loved ones on the other side. Something reminded me not to forget to say that. Too. David, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Your loved ones are with you. Talk to them. Talk to them. They're actually closer to you now than they were in life. There with you. Let them share your life with you. Be, become aware of them. David, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.